Just a short time ago, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department also gave a news conference. The spokeswoman there saying they are confident that someone was inside that cabin. They have reason to believe it was Dorner, and they believe he's still inside, even though the, the building has burned down. We'll have more of those statements in just a moment. First, here's more of what we know right now. Dorner was thought to be holed up in this cabin after a gunfight with law enforcement that left one deputy dead and another injured. We're going to hear from a member of the family that owns the cabin in just a moment. The cabin outside caught on fire earlier tonight after a tactical operation involving a SWAT team. The roadways were then cleared later on to let firefighters in to put out the fire. Here's how it all started. Earlier today, police got a report of a carjacking and the victim said the suspect looked like Dorner. The suspect then fled into the woods, barricaded himself, himself inside that cabin. Gunfire was exchanged, and during that gun battle, one deputy was killed, another was injured, airlifted to a hospital. That second deputy is expected to survive, according to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. A local CBS reporter, Carter Evans, was describing the situation by cell phone when a gunfight broke out. Listen. This is a very fluid situation. We're staying here. We don't want to get caught in the crossfire ourselves. Again, the Now, again, the LAPD is saying that they are still on tactical alert, still giving protection to all those people they've been protecting uh, since this manhunt began. That, despite reports to the contrary, no body has been found. And, in fact, no one has even gone into the cabin because it's still too hot. With the death of the deputy today, that brings Dorner's suspected death toll to four people. Dorner's also accused of killing another police officer, the daughter of his police union representative, and her fiancé. Now, just a short time ago, there was a third press conference with the California Fish and Wildlife spokesman. What's significant about what he says, and we're going to try to play that for you uh, shortly, is that essentially he said, first of all, a report went out that a vehicle had been stolen. The L.A. Times has reported uh, that Dorner had actually been holed up in another cabin elsewhere and had actually held several people, a couple hostage, for the last several days. That would explain why there's been no word of him and no information about him over the last several days since his burning vehicle was found uh, at the end of last week. Uh, a, a report went out that a vehicle had been stolen, a purple Nissan. Officials from the Fish and Wildlife Service were on the lookout for that when they saw another vehicle, a white pickup truck, coming their way. That pickup truck had reportedly been uh, carjacked when the purple uh, Nissan, uh, when uh, the suspect lost control of that, apparently carjacked uh, another driver, carjacked this white pickup truck. Shots were exchanged between Fish and Wildlife officials um, and the suspect in the, uh, the white Nissan. He then fled, and that's allegedly uh, when he ended up in that cabin. This has been a very dramatic day. We're going to play you some of that press conference coming up. We want to give you a look now at how the events unfolded today, starting this afternoon. Let's check in with our, our Miguel Marquez, who's been uh, on the scene uh, all day long. Uh, Miguel, let's just walk through and kind of take a step back um, and, and with what we know and what we don't know, because there's a lot of conflicting information right now. We've been trying to make the point all evening long, and frankly, for the hours that we've been covering this, that often first reports are, are contradictory, often turn out to be wrong. So at this point, what do we know? What do we not know? Well, we know that there is somebody in that cabin who is 
deceased. Uh, we don't know whether or not that person uh, killed themselves before police moved in or died in the in the flames uh, that, that destroyed that cabin. We don't know exactly how that fire started in that cabin. We know that the, the, the investigators or the, or the SWAT team went in with gas. Was it that that set it off or did the person inside set off that, uh, that, that conflagration? Um, we know that that person apparently tried to make a half-hearted attempt to escape by throwing a smoke canister outside of that door at one point, or at least we had that from several sources. He was forced back down into the, into the cabin, was not able to get out. Uh, San Bernardino uh, Sheriff's Office very certain now that they had the entire area cordoned off. They had it sealed off enough that they know that he did not get out of it, that they had helicopters overhead. That they know that uh, they were able to, to keep that person in that cabin and that everything that they know about Christopher Dorner's last movements or every sighting uh, of him up until that cabin brought him all the way into that cabin. Uh, so it is very, very likely. The, the other thing that I, I learned earlier that I didn't think of much when I first learned it is that his cell phone popped on earlier today, and it is possible that law enforcement was able to to talk to him and and at least by voice confirmed that it was him either on the run or in that cabin and try to ascertain whether he had hostages in there. That was clearly one of the big points where everything sort of mellowed at one point during the day. Everything stopped when they weren't sure whether they can go into that cabin and take him out uh, because they weren't sure if there were hostages. At one point they realized there were not and they they went in and you know we are where we are right now Anderson. Right and, and again we don't know a lot of the details of uh, the timeline on tear gas being fired whether they actually did physically go in or whether once uh, f once that building caught fire, whether they just waited outside. We're still waiting to try to get some of the operational details on that. Uh, how much communication, no. if any, was there between this suspect uh, and authorities? Uh, the other thing uh, that, that, Miguel, I'm curious about is, you know, there's been a lot made about the cooperation, and publicly officials, law enforcement officials, have been talking a lot about the cooperation between state and federal and, and local officials in all this. But earlier tonight, the LAPD gave a press conference saying they had resources standing by, waiting at the airport, waiting to be called in by the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. Um, we never got word whether those resources, and by resources, I assume they mean SWAT team members and the like, uh, whether those were ever called in. The LAPD has been making a big point that this was a San Bernardino Sheriff's Department operation. Um, do we know what the cooperation was? Is there, is there tension about this? This is uh, this. This gets into a difficult uh, situation with the different agencies that were involved here. There was a lot of competition between the agencies here. It's not entirely clear that San Bernardino was completely open to other agencies, be it federal or other local or other counties, coming into uh, San Bernardino to assist them. I mean, keep in mind that San Bernardino scaled back uh, the, the level of their search throughout this past week, thinking that Dorner may have left the area. Um, there were uh, several agencies said that they did offer San Bernardino lots of resources along the way, which San Bernardino said, nope, thank you very much, we're covered, no problem. Um, I think the perception among a lot of law enforcement here was one of frustration to some degree. When that thir when Thursday happened, the truck was up here with the broken axle and he set and, and Dorner set it on fire. The, the thinking was flood the zone, check every house, check everything, sit on this area. This is the only place that he can be. He must be here. It also snowed very heavily that night. So escaping would have been very, very difficult in that sort of snow. There were no reports of stolen cars, as far as we know, in that first day or two. So th there were there, there's not many ways off that mountain once you're up there. He either has to go back farther into the mountain or get off it somehow. Um, and so now we get to a point where San Bernardino is having to pull back its its searching throughout the day. They said they searched 600 empty cabins, but they were they were focusing on empty cabins and not able to focus on perhaps all of the cabins out there. And if it is the case, as the L.A. Times reporting, that these individuals were tied up for several days, that may be exactly what Dorner realizes, that they would search empty cabins and, and not, not focus on those that had people in them. Anderson? It's obviously been an incredibly difficult day for San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. They have lost one officer. Another officer was shot. We're told that officer underwent surgery and is going to be okay, that according to, uh, to officials. But again, they have lost one officer, and they have not yet named that officer. That's why we're not uh, giving out that name. Just a short time ago, there was a press conference, as I mentioned, with the California Fish and Wildlife spokesman. Here's what he said just moments ago. It's really fascinating. Uh, wants to recognize the heartfelt loss that we've, we've all experienced with one of our law enforcement brethren. 
with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office. And um, our hearts go out to the families of those officers, uh, the officer who was killed and the officer who was wounded. So uh, it's a it's a it's been a very sad day in law enforcement. But we, um, what I want to do is try to answer some of the questions that I can bring you up from the very first contact to when we last lost contact with our suspect. Okay. So basically, um, uh, I want to try to fill in some gaps. Basically, what happened was uh, the suspect was driving the purple Nissan. There was the bolo out for the Nissan. And one of our wardens was driving, actually, there were two wardens driving in one patrol truck. They were driving down Highway 32, and they were uh, uh, approaching two buses. They passed the two buses, and they noticed tucked in behind the bus was the, the suspect vehicle. They immediately attempted to do a U-turn, but because of the, the road was narrow and they had a, they couldn't get right on top of them. So they put the, ra the, the radio call out that they were engaged in a, in a pursuit of the suspect vehicle. The suspect quickly realized he had been identified. He passed the two school buses. By the time our wardens got up, he was in buses. He then turned onto Glass Road. Our warden, the initial warden, the two wardens in the one vehicle who initially found him didn't realize he turned on that glass road. They kept, continued on in front of the school buses. Of course, they put out over the radio what was going on. Three additional, <clears throat> three additional wardens in two vehicles, so two were paired up and one was by himself, continued on. They ended up turning onto glass. They were expecting to find the RAV. I'm sorry, it's not a RAV. Um, they were expecting to find the purple Nissan. They were looking, in fact, for this purple Nissan. The warden who was in the front was by himself. There were two wardens immediately behind him that were doubled up in their patrol vehicle. The warden who was in front realized, uh, noticed a white truck coming down, driving erratically at a pretty high rate of speed. Because he was drawn to this erratic behavior, he took a close look at the driver and recognized him as a suspect. Before he even had a chance to put it out over the radio, of course, they're driving now in opposite directions again. So he's already passed the suspect vehicle. The suspect rolled his window down, and when the second patrol truck came up with the two wardens inside, that's when he engaged in a shooting with our wardens at the, as they were driving. He did hit the truck multiple times. The wardens stopped their vehicle. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and take a drink. Um, the warden stopped their vehicle. Uh, that's helpful. Um, at that point, uh, where they did engage the suspect the second time, he shot at our wardens. They stopped the vehicle. As he continued around to bend in the curve, the warden had his patrol rifle. He went up onto uh, a location where he could engage the suspect, and he fired multiple rounds at the, at the suspect as he was driving away. It's unknown whether or not he was hit or how many times the truck was hit. That's all up in the air at this point. That's basically where Fish and Game or Fish and Wildlife wardens lost contact with the suspect. Of course, the radio call had gone out, and there's a, you know, now the whole world's coming to help. So was your understanding, sir, that there were two vehicles that the suspect was in? The purple vehicle first and the white pickup truck? Uh, the question was about whether the suspect was in, actually in, ended up being in two vehicles. The first was a purple Nissan which he ultimately appeared to have been driving too fast, lost control of the vehicle, crashed it, carjacked the second white pickup, and then was fleeing the scene, which is when our warden noticed him. Hey, well, let me ask you, when the original Bolo came out with that purple Nissan, did you hear or did any of your wardens hear that this 911 call came from two women who may have been held hostage and they own that purple Nissan and one of the women escaped and was able to call for help, and that's how you guys got the original bolo. That's I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the source of the bolo. I, all I know is that when the bolo came out, everybody was looking for the purple Nissan, and that's when they noticed the suspect as he was driving to drive away. Do you have away. any idea who owned that purple Nissan? Was there any inclination that this came from somebody who was carjacked, uh, came from a 911 call, the source of this uh, purple Nissan? That I'm afraid I don't know the answer to. Hey, you know how many rifle shots were fired? Quite a few. I don't have that exact number, uh, but he did engage uh, with quite a few 
quite a few rounds. Um, I you, probably, uh, I'd, more than 12, to, no, more than a dozen, more than 15, probably uh, right around that area. Suspect fire. A weapon he was using based on the holes in the vehicle and the shots they were hearing. Yet when he did engage the second vehicle that he passed, he held a pistol out the window and fired multiple shots. And he hit the truck multiple shots. What's your name again, sir? Um, somebody's asked for my name again. It's Lieutenant Patrick. Senior contributor, former FBI Assistant Director Tom Fuentes, who joins us now on the phone.